if somebody has anemic tendencies, uh, the bone marrow peptide is one of the very best peptides you can use um, to help stimulate this healthy release of red blood cells. The other peptide that does it is ARA290, and that helps support the kidneys, balances the red blood cells. And so it is, um, it's one of those, those peptides that um, we haven't seen with with our patients who do have like iron overload, we've actually seen ARA290 seem to um, balance it out, even though you'd think it's working on the uh, urethropoietin pathway. Um, you'd think it would elevate that, but actually I've, I've used it myself to see if I would get a spike and uh, it actually brought it down a little bit. So, um, so yeah, seems to be well tolerated, but um, using the bone marrow um, bioregulators can be great if you've got issues with, with, uh, iron or ferritin or anyone who has anemic tendencies and, and the anemic tendencies, um, Dan, what are the main symptoms that you're looking for when you, when you have a patient who's got anemia? Well, you'll start to see just overall their metabolism just tanks, you know, so they'll, um, brain fog, you know, they'll typically have cold intolerance, cold hands, cold feet, you know, their, their nail beds typically are, are pretty pale. They're not pink. Um, you know, you look at their tongue and they tell if it's real severe, the tongue will start to lose its color. A lot of times, like a really good example is the inner eyelid, you know, it's supposed to be really like, you know, really nice and red. If it's a, if it's a female, we'll typically see, um, a, a drop in the, the amount of days or the volume of their menstrual cycle. We'll also, you know, that might be the source of it for a lot of those people. Um, but uh, brutal nails, the hair starts to fall out. Um, that's a really common, you know, people with that, that hair loss, you know, people, the two big things we see that is usually thyroid or low iron. But um, yeah, so those are, those are a lot of things. And then on the laboratory work, we start seeing issues with detoxification and hormone um, manufacturing within the body because you, the iron based uh, enzyme cytochrome P450 you know, you need that for detoxification, you need it for hormone um, uh, building. So to be able to, to do the building blocks, but you also start to see people have issues with um, muscle fatigue, a real like lingering soreness after workouts because those muscle cells those myoglobulins are iron-based. So those are, I'd say those are the big guys, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and uh, really important to look out for that because uh, especially in your fertility practice, Dan, uh, you see a lot of that. And if that doesn't get resolved, you know, it's going to be really challenging to have a healthy baby. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and the, it's, it's super important for fertility. The, the baby will get its first nine months of iron from the mom in the last trimester. So having optimal iron mm -hmm. is, is incredible, right? Um, so you can see his cholesterol markers. So now we're, you know, once again, if you're thinking of, um, iron, you're thinking of ferritin, um, those whole pathways, you think ARA 290, um, think tessamorelin for the liver function or CJC 1295, um, even IGF one, because you've got 600% more receptors for IGF one than you do for insulin and your insulin sensitivity will help stabilize this a lot as well. But the other thing is think of that bone marrow bioregulator. That's going to be your, your, your peptide there. So let's move on to the cholesterol, the triglycerides, um, you know, LDL, HDL, small particles, large particles. I mean, if we think of the ratios as well, um, you can see a dramatic improvement in um, where he was to where he is now. So uh, massive drop in inflammation. So Danny, I think that's the other thing that we did is, uh, you know, getting rid of the infection, getting rid of the inflammation in his body. That's what lowered the ferritin so dramatically. Um, but the other thing that you can look at here is um, the fact that uh, the bioregulators for the heart, there's a, a really powerful bioregulator called Ventorf and, or Ventfort. And um, and this is a powerful bioregulator because what it does is it helps with the vessels. And, uh, so I think that's one of the things we forget is, uh, we think the heart is the, like pumping the blood. That's just impossible. And, uh, I, I learned this. I remember when I, I, I think it was actually, 
um, in my school because Earl Bakken was the founder of my my Chinese medical school. And so he taught like the heart has, it's very little, if you think of the mechanics of the heart pumping the blood, the heart pumps very little of the blood, but it's actually the vessels that are contracting the smooth muscles in the vessels. Those are contracting and moving the blood throughout your body. And so um, you'll notice as we start going through these bioregulator stacks, one of the most important uh, peptides is the Ventor peptide. And because what that does is it activates the peptides that reside on the arterial wall, and that allows us to repair the damage to the blood vessels. So pretty interesting. So how, how many of your patients have some dysregulation in, in their, their cholesterol or lipid profiles, Dan? Oh, that's, it's very rare that someone comes in who doesn't have an issue there. You know, they're, they're, the 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 lipids are always really disrupted for most of the people that come in yeah it, it it's pretty interesting and so uh if you look at the you know like his triglycerides were were starting to go up his ldl cholesterol was starting to go up you can see his alt's going up so you know we were concerned about fatty liver disease because so many of our patients show up in fatty liver disease I think now there's a drug that's on the market to treat it. Have Have you heard of the this drug to treat fatty liver disease? No. Is there? Yeah. A, is there? There's a new. There's a new drug out. I I can't remember what it is. I need to look that up. I'll look it up on the break. But um, or Kate or Annie or someone who's in the back end uh, who wants to do a little research, uh, see if there's a drug for fatty liver disease. It feels um, like because, an oxymoron, doesn't it? it? It really does. It's like, well, here, take this and we'll lower your chances of having fatty liver disease. Oh, thanks, kid. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so so that's something that we see, but there's really no treatment for it. Um, and the big thing we did for him is we had him start lifting weights again. Mm -hmm. And we uh, had him change his diet. We had him, you know, completely and change his sleep habits. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was going to bed between midnight and 1 a.m. And he'd wake up every morning at five o'clock. Good Lord. Yeah. Just, uh, he's an animal. Coolest not guy. Yeah. Not sustainable. <laughs> not for him. It was sustainable for about, uh, you know, four decades of his adult life. <laughs> so he had, <laughs> he had some horsepower, but um, but he was very disciplined, but yeah, started going, going to bed. Oh, and Kate says from the Cleveland clinic, there's no medication specifically for fatty liver disease. Doctors focus on managing factors. Okay. I, I read it in a, some nuanced article. I think it's coming down the pipeline because there's so much money to be had in that. Um, Tucker pulled up, uh, thanks Tucker. He, in his Google search of fatty liver disease, he pulled up Kispectin, a new drug to treat fatty liver disease. Now that is interesting because Kispectin's working on the luteinizing and follicular stimulating hormones. Um, any idea of how the that would treat fatty liver disease? I'm not. I, I'd have to look at the mechanism. There's one thing I was going to talk about, and and they they've done a lot of research, and I've seen a couple of articles out here in the in the last two years on this, and they were looking at people that had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and alcohol-related fatty liver disease. And they were specifically looking at alcoholics, super fascinating. And they were they were looking at alcohol consumption, trying to narrow it down, like when does it actually occur? And they found that in both cases, fatty liver disease does not start until the person gets leaky gut. Wow. So that's yeah. the beginning is, and anytime there's intestinal permeability, the vessels, you're going to have some impermeability there. And, well, uh, yeah, and think about when we're using liposomal because they get, they get access through the hepatic portal. So yep. the, the, like an alcoholic, they can just maintain all this alcohol in, until their microbiome shifts massively. And when you start to open up the permeability in the gut, you get direct access to the liver. So all that bacteria and everything in the gut gets direct access to the liver through the hepatic portal and activates the immune cells in the gut that are in the, in the liver, the Kupfer cells. 
And that seems to drive the fatty liver process. Like the, the, the liver can maintain, mm. maintain, but the moment it, the gut loses integrity, fatty liver just accumulates fast. Hey everybody, Reagan Archbald here. I hope you enjoyed the Go Wellness show and maybe learned a couple things you could apply to your practice. If you're a healthcare entrepreneur who wants to work in an academic think tank with like-minded humans who are just like you, looking to provide better service, better quality of care for your patients, reach us at info at and we're happy to do a free practice analysis for you.